Hey, thanks for coming to uh, the Westport Astronomical Society. I'm Dan Wright, one of the board members, ex-president. Don't want to ever do that again. I learned my lesson. <laughs> but nobody will let me leave the board. I kept trying to. But I think well, you I no, I did not. <laughs> I keep my sanity. I did not. No, no. Um, so it's such a pleasure to have Professor Tan back here again. This is his third time back. And last time, uh, we we're going to have him come up here. And of course, we we're canceled because of COVID. So we couldn't uh, we couldn't have him for that third time. So a couple years later, here he is again. And uh, it's just a joy. And and uh, and he was like our first choice of people that I wanted to reach out to as we started doing talks again here in the classroom. Just a little bit of background on uh, on Joshua Tan. He's an optical astronomer by training, intensely interested in short period binary millisecond pulsars. And uh, aside from that, open problems in binary modeling, neutron star physics, and three body dynamics that occupy most of his research think space. And recently he became entangled with the project to commission a research and teaching telescope at Grand Mesa Observatory right outside of Grand Junction, Colorado. And that has remote access, observing from New York City or really anywhere in the world. So you can be, you know, sitting around your PJs at home, and you've got a nice little telescope that you're using in Grand Junction. And uh, it also can be used too at the uh, Astrophysics Division at the American Museum of Natural History. And the telescope is now operational. And he had talked about it last time that he was here. And that video is uh, available up on YouTube right now. And he's also been contributing light curves to the database of the American Association. Of variable star observers. So please welcome back to the Westport Astronomical Society, Professor Joshua Taylor. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction. Thanks for having me back. It's great to be back here in person. Plug in. Plug in. Plug in. Plug in. All right, new speech, dark matter. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Hold your breath. Um, so this is my third time, and I try to do a different talk each time, of course. You can want to hear the same thing over and over again. So um, this was a talk that I first gave maybe three years ago. Um, because the physics club at LaGuardia Community College got very interested in a press release um, story that came out, more or less saying something along these lines. And people were curious, skeptical, wondering what this all meant. And so I gave a presentation to try to explain it. Some of the work that I've done in the past is a little related to this. Um, but uh, over the years, I've come to follow the story very carefully. Um, it keeps going away. Um, it's, uh, it's just a delay. Okay. So I, first I want to say that this, um, this title is a little bit of a clickbait title in a sense. Um, I'm going to claim that it's perfectly fine for us to say that our galaxy once was a quasar, but it is definitely the case that you could argue against that um, and say that that actually is the situation. And it's dependent on what you mean when you say quasar. So I'm going to try to describe what a quasar is, what the history of that is. And then I'm going to try to convince you that this is the case, that at one point in the history of our galaxy, we were a quasar. And uh, maybe I'll convince you, maybe I won't, but we'll try, try and see what we can do. So to start off, um, this is something that everybody here should be familiar with, but it's something I feel obligated, nevertheless, to let you all know about. We're going to be interested in electromagnetic radiation, which I usually just call light, because I'm um, uh, fond of it that way. And uh, all of these will come into play in this discussion. So normally, of course, we deal with the optical, which is down here. 
in its uh, wavelength glory. Uh, but we'll be dealing with radio, gamma rays, x-rays, even infrared and microwaves will make an appearance. Um, not so much the UV, but occasionally we may reference to it. So we want to make sure we have all of this uh, for our discussion. And what we need to do to understand what a quasar is, is understand this instrument. So does anyone recognize this instrument? Yeah, this is a single slit uh, spectrograph. So the idea is that you have your um, slit that you align on your object that you want to take a spectrum of. So you want to see all the different wavelengths of light that you can. Um, and then focus that onto a diffraction grating, which reflects that light back through another lens that then focuses it on your detector. So rather than get a beautiful picture like we saw earlier, just get a nice line straight across, um, which you then have to be very careful about measuring. One end of the line will be the red and the other end will be the blue. And depending on exactly the parameters that you've set up, you might see a wider and narrow range of wavelengths. Uh, spectrographs can be uh, sensitive all the way into the infrared or infrared wavelengths that you can't see with our eyes that are um, uh, getting through our atmosphere and can be seen with the right instruments. Um, and so this is the game for a lot of people. When the spectrograph was first invented, uh, people were pretty excited to see that stars have a very peculiar spectrum. Um, many of which matched the sun, which was sort of the first star to be uh, imaged by a spectrograph, but some of them do not. So here I have some images of spectra that you have seen in the past. And so at the top left, I'm showing the zoo of possible stars. So you take your spectra, spectrograph and you take a spectrum of a star. This is what you expect to see. And so the main features that I typically point out are that you can see that there are some stars which obviously have more blue light than red light. And that's what you call the color of the star when we just look at it in the image. And you can see that the ones at the top have more blue light than red light. So if you were to look at them, they would look a little bit blue for the ones. And of course, the bottom, the M stars, they very red. But the other key feature that is visible in here are the, of course, the spectral lines. These are the absorption features that were a big mystery when they were first discovered by Fraunhofer and then since then have been associated with individual atoms and gases and explained only after quantum mechanics was fully developed. It took that long to really do the sorts of calculations that could at least begin the process of explaining why we have these lines. And it's uh, unfortunate that that calculation is sort of hard for everything but hydrogen. So hydrogen turns out to be one of the main lines we see in here. Everything else, uh, you basically have to compare to um, lamps. You have to have a lamp with the gas in it and then see what you see in order to make a comparison to what you expect the, um, the line to show up as at a certain table like what you actually see. So this is a nice view. I like the kind of photographic views, it's the old fashioned view of spectrum. This is a nice one to see. But of course, when you go to a telescope, um, that it has a uh, CCD readout. These days, you typically get a plot like you see in the bottom. And this is the same data, essentially, just seen in different ways. And you can imagine that you might want to go out and uh, look at different stars, hopefully see the spectrum coming from these different stars, maybe identify them. And that's where our story of quasars first starts. 
So the story of quasars is that there's a star out there in the sky. This is about 12th magnitude star, so pretty dim. It's a fairly good telescope to see it. It's just especially need a good telescope if you're going to take a spectrum. So you take a spectrum of any object. The object is faint enough, and then you're kind of splitting that light up, making it uh, fainter and fainter. So this was the object in question. It was known as a radio star. The reason it was known as a radio star is because it showed up in a radio catalog that had been published. And they knew it was coming from this star because of lunar occultation studies in the radio. You basically wait until the moon passed over this thing time at exactly right. And you can tell fairly precisely where it was in the sky, match your sky maps and say, okay, this star is the same source as these radio waves. And so Martin Schmidt and Bev Oak went out and got a spectrum of this. And I show it to you down here. This is the spectrum. Um, they didn't have the fancy plots that we did. Uh, they could translate it. Um, so this is what the plot actually looks like when they take the spectrum. And I, for comparison, showed you where the um, uh, visible lights uh, was. So from uh, violet all the way up to red, what that is. I have to interrupt you. There's a Jeep that there are a lot of the car alarms going on out front. A Jeep? Yeah, it's a Jeep. So if you do have a Jeep, your car alarm is honking away and it's here too. Probably. Yeah, it's just not stop. Made you break the window. Thought about it. <laughs> Um, so this was the spectrum that they found uh, when they took the spectrum of this radio star. And it is weird, right? If I go back and look at these stars here, another two. Somebody drive a Jeep. We'll run up one. It's done. Stop. So if I compare these spectra to what I see over here, you can see that basically none of them seem to match. And what is worse is that although this sort of spectrum is sometimes seen in certain stars, uh, these things are typically called cataclysmic variables, um, these big lines, which are sort of the inverse of the absorption lines we saw over here, the dark features, have become bright features um, should line up with known atoms. And they simply didn't. So in 1963, when this data was first published, the conclusion that Martin Schmidt came to was that these were actually well known atoms. They had just been shifted quite a bit over. And that what you were expecting, and it's a little hard to see, but you were expecting to see hydrogen down here, and what you instead saw was that it had shifted over to the red, but not by a little bit, by a lot. You took the fractional percentage of the spectrum, and what you actually ended up seeing was like shift over, shifted over by more than 10%, uh, which was absolutely enormous. And this caused quite a lot of controversy when it was first published. But this might not be what's actually going on. How could this 12th magnitude object experience this? So what's the theory? Why do you get that sort of shift? Well, this is the classic redshift that we talk about and know about and love. But let me just explain to you how bizarre this redshift is. So the whole idea of redshift is that you're looking at something that's moving away from you. And the faster you're moving away, the more the shift occurs. And you can figure out approximately the speed that you're moving away by taking that fractional redshift and multiplying by the speed of light. So if this thing was at about one sixth the fraction of the entire spectra, that means this object was traveling at one sixth the speed of light away from us which is ridiculously fast, right? That's something along the lines of 30,000 kilometers a second or something like that. Very fast thing, just zipping away. Um, 
And there's that, that sort of speed just really doesn't happen in your day-to-day -day lives, even in the bizarre world of astrophysics. There are a few instances where I can think of where you can get something moving that fast. Uh, but typically, you need one effect to get a redshift of that size. And at the time, it hadn't been seen, although we now have a lot more data to show that that's the case. And this is the effect that you does anyone recognize this plot up here? Sometimes called the most famous plot in cosmology. Is it? What's that? This is the plot that Edwin Hubble published when he demonstrated that uh, there was a relationship between the speed of what were then called the spiral nebulae, and we now know our external galaxies to our own. Um, and their distance, they were sort of related, uh, very, very strongly correlated. This was a remarkable result, uh, remarkable enough to make the front page of the New York Times at the time, and was immediately interpreted in terms of Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity, or at least very, very quickly. Um, in fact, the person that really came up with the idea, George Lemaitre, probably and you know, almost not just probably, definitely kind of knew that this was the case from data that had come out before Hubble. And so now we sometimes call the Hubble constant the hubble lemaitre constant. The idea is that as you are further away from um, us here in the Milky Way, you are moving away faster and faster. And those relationships are um, matched further away, the faster you move. And the typical uh, explanation for that is that the universe is expanding further away you are, the faster things are moving out. So this is what Hubble published in his data. Uh, you can see that he's going out to millions of parsecs multiplied by three for light years, if you'd like. Um, he's measuring speeds here in kilometers per second. Uh, I, he actually had a calibration error, so it's not quite accurate, uh, but the correlation is there. There's some accurate data down here at the bottom here. Oh. This is what's uh, the sort of a remarkable thing to think about is that we're talking about an object that has a speed right here at the top, which means that if it's due to this expansion of the universe, and that is basically the only explanation that anyone is going to buy. You know, how else are you going to get something shooting out one sixth the speed of light? You're talking about a distance of 500 megaparsecs or well over a billion light years away. Mm. And so people were <coughs> questioning whether this could actually be the case. How could you get an object that was 12, like more than a billion light years away? at 12th magnitude in the sky. It just seems silly. Um, well, it turns out that you can get things that bright. And when you start to describe this phenomenon, they began to discover lots of them. And the idea was that they were quasi-stellar. They weren't exactly stars, but they definitely acted like stars in the sense that they were small. You could see variations in them, and that meant they actually came from a pretty small object. Uh, in order to have any sort of variation, uh, you have to um, be able to change the things in the object over the course of the light travel time. At least that's the um, kind of upper limit that you can have. And you can see variations in these quasi-stellar objects that would last over the course of, in some cases, hours. So they had to be fairly small. And they were very far away, and they were extremely bright. And so eventually, this thing became quasars. Now, other people argue they maybe they were other sorts of things, but we have some convincing evidence now that this is really what these are sort of these small objects, very bright from extremely far distance and extreme far, extremely distant objects that are moving away from us due to the expansion of the universe. So what could these things be? Well, we've got an example of something that's somewhat similar, not too far away from us. That's this. 
what is this? Looks like so, the jet off M87. M87, right. <laughs> this is the jet off M87. This is a sort of interesting object, right? It was first uh, kind of studied by Hubble as well, who at first thought it was maybe something like a globular cluster, which are just sort of clusters of stars, but then he realized this was much further away, much more akin to one of these spiral nebulae he was interested in. Um, and the haze that you see around it, that's just all stars. And this isn't a gigantic object, probably a trillion stars, the biggest uh, galaxy in the Virgo cluster, which is our sort of cluster that's the downtown area of the galaxies that are around us. But what's interesting is the jet that's coming off of this. And this jet is something that you could see and you just take a picture um, if you're very good at doing astrophotography, it shows up. And it's, it's sort of an interesting phenomenon because it's also changing at a pretty rapid rate. You can measure the speed that this jet is moving. It's moving at a fair fraction of the speed of light itself, which is pretty remarkable, at least when you compare it to the galaxy that it's coming out of. So arguments have been made for years about what could produce such an energetic phenomenon. And we know now that most jets that we see of this sort are formed by material that is spiraling in, collapsing in under some gravitational interactions, in particular accretion, which is this uh, process by which material spirals into different objects, tends to produce these sorts of energetic jets. And so the idea is that there's something that's accreting at the very center. It's extremely close to the exact center of this galaxy. Something that is accreting material and then spewing out one of these jets. Uh, the details continue to be worked out, but that's the general thought of what's happening here. And it's a tremendous amount of energy. Now, this jet is not pointed towards us, but you can do some calculations about what would happen if the jet was pointed towards us. <laughs> if it was pointed towards us, it would be one of the brightest things we would see in the sky. It would definitely be up there with uh, the brightest stars, but it's not, it's pointed away from us. And so that's a very intriguing observation. We know that the object that's doing the accretion at the center has to be extremely massive and extremely compact. And when you do the calculation, you end up figuring out that this has to be a supermassive black hole. And for a long time, this was just sort of a pretty strong speculation, people would say. It seems a little bit outrageous, but there, there you go. Um, but just recently, that black hole was imaged, in fact. Um, and I'm not going to show you an image of that one. You can go look it up yourself. I'm going to show you an image of a different one that's more interesting to our particular story here. But this was the beginning of the idea, is that maybe you could produce this amount of energy that was required to see this bright thing that's very, very far away through material accreting onto a black hole and producing these energetic jets among other energetic things that would happen as the stuff spirals in. Here's another example of this happening. This object that you know, Centaurus. Yeah, Centaurus A, named for its radio signature. So the A is indicating that it's the brightest radio source in the constellation Centaurus. And the radio um, is actually seen here in kind of the orange, there's the you know, superimposition of what the radio. So these, these big lobes that are coming out of this otherwise peculiar and interesting galaxy, Centaurus. And it's the same story as we saw with in 87. The material is coming out from this supermassive black hole at the center that's doing the creating. And you can do the same game where you calculate how much energy is being produced by that. It's again, we're seeing it off, we're not seeing it directly on. Um, but intriguingly, this is the same sort of radio signal that we saw with um, the first quasar that was discovered, 3C273. 
one I showed you in the beginning. So the connection began to be made that maybe these radio uh, galaxies are connected to these very bright jets. And in general, when you see very bright centers of galaxies, there's this name that they give them, active galactic nuclei, MGM. And this was the story for a long time, and this continues to be our best understanding of what's going on with these arts. And some people still were skeptical. He said, well, I think quasars might just be these weird things that just have strange riches for some reason and are just little stars. Um, but this was kind of put to rest by observations from the Hubble Space Telescope in particular, which could use something called a coronagraph to cover up the bright quasar. This is the same quasar I showed you in the beginning. And when they cover up the bright uh, quasar source at the center, what you end up seeing surrounding it is other stuff. What is that other stuff? <clears throat> That's the galaxy. So this actually confirms that this galaxy is about uh, a billion light years away. Um, you can take a redshift, if you'd like, of the galaxy itself, not just the quasar, and confirm that. So we've now, um, as of, let's say, 25 years ago, uh, found the host galaxies for quasars, kind of putting to rest some of the controversies that were surrounding them. So we're very confident that that's what's going on. We're seeing the active centers of galaxies producing tremendous amounts of energy. And that's the story of what a quasar is. Um, this whole thing kind of came together after a while in a unified view. So this is the unified view quasars, and there's all sorts of different names when they came from different parts of astrophysics in their uh, observations. So this supermassive black hole is here at the center, and surrounding it is the material that's spiraling in. That's the so-called accretion disk. But then there's all this other stuff going on. There's material on the outside that hasn't quite made its way into the accretion disk. That's sometimes called the dusty torus. And then there's other blobs of material that are sort of swirling around like a beehive. Um, these things are seen in kind of ellipses and circles that you see here. And then, of course, the jet is being produced, it's spewing out from that uh, accretion disk. And depending on where you, where you see it, you call this thing a different thing. So if you look directly down the jet, you call this thing a blazar. And blazars are seen in high energy asteroids, X-rays and gamma rays. They're some of the brightest things we see in gamma rays and they're halfway across the universe. Because we're looking directly down that jet that we saw in the in 87 um, picture. If you were to look at M87 in that way, you'd be able to see its gamma rays from halfway across the universe. Quasars tend to be viewed at about this angle right here, where you can still see the bright accretion disk, that's the quasar itself. But then there are other things that are going on as well. There are these clumps of material that produce different um, styles of lines that we saw in the spectrum. Some of them are narrow lines and some of them are broad lines. And if they're broad, they tend to be closer to the black hole. And if they're narrow, they tend to be far away. And I'll let you think about why that is. You can ask later. Um, but there are other things that we see in that fashion as well, sometimes not so bright. Seifert type 1 galaxies were identified at about the same time. We now know them to be about the same sort of thing, just not quite as bright as quasars. And broadline radio galaxies. Kind of very similar. It's called BLAC objects uh, to quasars. If you're looking directly through the dusty torus, you don't see things as bright uh, anymore. Um, but then uh, we see these things called Seifert type 2 and narrow line uh, radio galaxies. And this unified picture is kind of what we now think of when we think of quasars, when we think of active galactic nuclei. This is the story of what we're seeing. And I want to tell you that I think our galaxy 
once had this happening in its center. It doesn't anymore. But at one time it did. We have evidence that that's the case. Another thing to point out is that we now know that all galaxies have these central supermassive black holes. Well, maybe there's one or two that don't, but they're very, very unusual. Essentially, every time we look, we find one. And there's also a relationship. The bigger the galaxy, the bigger the black hole. Um, that's a little bit unusual. There's no particular reason to think that that should be the case, but it is phenomenologically when we look at it. We see that bigger galaxies have bigger black holes. There is a misconception that sometimes goes around that the whole galaxy is orbiting around the black hole. That's not the case. The galaxy massively outweighs whatever black holes at the center, even if it's supermassive, billions of masses of, uh, of solar masses of material at that center. Galaxies are hundreds of billions, of trillions of times. Um, and more massive than the sun. So they massively outweigh the black hole at the center. And so all those orbits are really going around the galaxy itself. It's not really centered around the black hole. The black holes, if they're this massive through a process called dynamical friction, over a very short period of time, some millions of years, let's say 100 million years at most, end up in the center of galaxies. That's where they'll end up. And so it kind of ends up looking a little bit like a solar system, but it's not really the same analog. You get just the black hole that lands itself at the center and the galaxy is kind of going around its business. But this is the case. When you have a massive black hole, it ends up at the center and if material starts to spiral into it, well then you end up with a quasar or something like a quasar. The argument about whether it's a quasar or not comes from the question of how big the black hole is. Is it a million solar mass object that's producing the um, bright emission? Then maybe it's something called a Seifert galaxy. But if it's up closer to a billion or at least you know tens of millions or hundreds of millions of times, then it's getting into quasar territory, but really it's just a continuum from the most massive down to the less massive. Our own galaxy has a supermassive black hole at the center that has about four and a half million times the mass of our sun. M87 is more like five, six, maybe six and a half, I think is the, the, the correct measurement, the last time when people were measuring, six and a half billion times the mass of our sun. So there's a wide range of these supermassive black holes. And I think that's where some of the arguments come into whether uh, what we call a quasar. But I'm going to say that they're very similar processes all the way down, and that they just as a matter of scale, some things are bright, some things are not. So this is the sort of picture that you should have in your head now of what a quasar is: material coming in, spiraling into this accretion disk at the center, into a supermassive black. And then that supermassive black hole accretion causes a jet to come out. I think this is the same image that was used in heaven. So that jet spews out. And then if I look directly on it, I see a quasar. If I look more at this angle, it's a quasar. Here's another fun little artist's impression of what this brick looks like. Of course, we never see things like this, but the modeling seems to indicate that that's what's going on. We Maybe this is the dusty torus surrounding. <laughs> and we now know that there's millions of these quasars. Every red dot that you see here is a quasar. And they go out pretty far. This is in look back time. As you get farther away, the measurement of time and how far away things are in terms of light years and time gets kind of skewed a little bit because of the expansion of the universe. So we often think in terms of look back time since the universe has a finite age. Um, so depending on how you want to calculate this, right, this is like halfway across the universe. Uh, and you can see how many of those quasars there are. There's enough of these quasars that you can actually calculate whether there should be one near us at some point in our history. This was first done in the 1980s. And it turns out that absolutely there should be one within, let's say, uh, a few 
maybe, maybe one million light years, there should be a dead quasar. Yes. And there is, so I say. It's the one that's at the center of our galaxy. Mm -hmm. So this is our galaxy. Um, I'm going to try to look for this, this thing here. And I'm going to expect it to be right here at the center. So off we go, looking towards the center of our galaxy. And if I look towards the center, it's sort of right here. This is Sagittarius. There's a really bright spot here. And, and in this is a, actually a pretty dense cluster of stars. It's called the nuclear star cluster. These clusters of stars were formed out of a lot of material not too long ago, a few millions of years ago. And that's actually the first hint that we have that our galaxy once was a quasar, because where do those stars come from? They have to come from material. That material is very close to the supermassive black hole. It's not that far to jump, but that material at that time, some of it may have gone all the way in and lit up the sky. This is another view of our galaxy. Any you know, anyone know what wavelengths we're looking at here? UV? No, not UV. Yeah. This is uh, this is the radio wavelengths. A little hard to see, but this big loop here is the give, the giveaway. Uh, and as I zoom in, this is actually much easier to do with radio because I can use interferometry to do this. So this is a very famous image. It's made a few years ago of the central regions. Um, this is that central cluster of stars, right? There's all kinds of other weird things going on, big bubbles that are probably from old supernova, all sorts of strange things happening. These sort of lines coming off are the um, uh, emissions of uh, called synchrotron emissions, material that's spiraling around magnetic fields, very chaotic fascinating area to study the center of our galaxy. And this is uh, kind of honing in on that uh, view of the center of our galaxy in radio. The brightest object there, Sagittarius A, again, the A means brightest thing in the constellation um, in radio, uh, is this source that we now associate with the supermassive black hole. Center, Sagittarius A star. And we've proven more or less that there is a black hole there through this amazing Nobel Prize worthy study by Andrea Giddens. I'm going to play the movie. Here it goes. You can't see the center of our galaxy in the optical, it's obscured by clouds in the way. But in the infrared, you can. And so from Keck, which is Hawaii, this group was able to monitor over the course of, let me go back here and do it, the course of some decades, the movement of these stars around some sort of central unseen, and that's the central supermassive black hole, that's exactly coincident with the radio source. The idea being that there's some material that's coming in from the radio that's very, very bright here, and the stars are orbiting around the supermassive black hole. And you can calculate what the mass of this object has to be, and it's about 4 million times the mass of the sun. The only thing that we can fit in that small of a space, at 4 million times the mass of the sun, is a black hole. So that sort of seals the deal. If that didn't convince you, then a few years ago, they went ahead and took a picture of the thing. <laughs> so again, this is starting from that beautiful image that we saw from the radio using interferometry, which is using two different telescopes to get a better view. Actually, you get a longer baseline. You can see smaller things in extent um, to try to see as tiny as we can on the sky because black holes are tiny on the sky. And you start off at the center here. Those are the, the stars that are swirling through, and you're coming in smaller and smaller and smaller until we get this famous image of the black hole at the center. Um, I think that was about a year ago now that came out. Amazing press release. So I hope I convinced you that there is a supermassive black hole at the center. <clears throat> now I just have to convince you 
and it was once a quasar. Well, here's the first hint. This is another picture of the galaxy in a different wave band. Anyone know which wave band this is? It's a little bit higher energy. This is a gamma ray picture of our galaxy. And it's beautiful for many reasons. I study gamma rays very intently these days. But one thing I'd like to pull your uh, attention to, and it's a little hard to see on here, but if you get a very um, uh, high res view of this, you'll be able to see it. There's kind of these two balloons that are coming out of the center. Can you see those? Yeah. They're definitely there. And when the, this first was, this is the Fermi Space Telescope that made this map. When this was first seen, these bubbles were um, uh, discovered and, and discussed. And it's a, basically the smoking gun for what's going on. You have material that has been moving out at incredibly high speeds, very high energies for some millions of years. You can calculate the speed they're going, they're not going to the speed of light, but they're going fast enough that when they travel, let's say 100,000 light years or so that they've been traveling, um, you can work out that they came from some sort of event that happened a few million years ago, or between six, two and six million years, depending on exactly how the speeds have changed and what model you adopt. So these are, famously called the Fermi bubbles. And they were first discovered using gamma ray observations. And this is an artist's impression of what they look like that we pulled out. There's also um, some evidence that there's a jet that has come out and is now much fainter than it was in the past, but still there. This is also seen in other wavelengths as well. This is a map of the central region of our galaxy using the WMAP space uh, telescope, which was a microwave telescope that was meant to study the microwave background, completely different subject, but there's other microwaves that come out. And if you look carefully, you can see the same shape showing up in the microwaves as you see in the gamma rays. And there's associated processes which would produce, produce microwaves alongside the gamma rays for this sort of energetic shock wave traveling through space. And not to be outdone, you know, just a few years ago, this is an X-ray view. Here we have, this is E. Rosita, the um, latest and greatest X-ray telescope up there. And the same thing is seen. This bubble is actually bigger than the Fermi bubbles. So it probably was produced about the same time. It may have been a different event. People are talking about it, but it's still on the same scale, millions of years. People also have looked at the material inside of this and seeing that it's at a very high temperature compared to other material in the galaxy, indicating that it kind of exploded out from there at some point two to six million years ago. Some event was happening that produced these giant bubbles, jets that look very similar to what we see in other quasar interactions. Now I have bad news for you. You say, okay, so if our galaxy was a quasar, could we see it? What would it have looked like two million years ago if you went out at night? You wouldn't have seen it. Well, if you had the right instrument, you could have, but with visible, no, no hope. You're losing 20 uh, magnitudes of uh, the light when you're looking <laughs> towards the center of the galaxy. But what about someone in a different galaxy? If they were to look at us and see us, would they be able to tell me where the quasar? are? How about Andromeda, for example? Well, I'm going to turn that question on its head. What if we took the amount of energy that have had to come out in those millions of years and turned it into an object that was as bright at the distance of Andromeda as it would be from someone from Andromeda looking at the Milky Way? So do people recognize this part of the spot? This is Andromeda. See, everyone see it? Yep. It's right there. No, it's right there. But what if Andromeda was experiencing exactly the amount of energy that I was describing? Oh, it looked like that. Mm -hmm. So 
to most people that I would talk to, that's not very impressive. What if it was pointed at us? Uh, so if it was pointed at us, we would get the gamma rays. We would get high energy material. So I could show you a very bright gamma. But basically, it looked the same, right? Mm -hmm. Because what we see is the equation. look about the same. Uh, we might get fried <laughs> instead. That's what I was thinking, yeah. But, uh, but, but, but this would be the view. Um, and so, yeah, as I say, it's, it's not, it's very far away, right? I think that's pretty impressive. This is about a magnitude two star where Andromeda. So you think it's like one of those you know, top 10 stars practically in the sky uh, associated with the center of the galaxy. And that's at a distance of the distance to Andromeda, which is millions of light years away. So, right. So it's a pretty dramatic. That's what it would have looked like. That's what would have been there. Is that a quasar? Well, some people say a quasar has to be more than 10 billion solar masses before it really can be called a quasar. I think that's kind of an arbitrary thing. I think that this is pretty impressive. It definitely looks very similar to that 3C273. Or there's a background galaxy there in a little bit. So I hope that's somewhat convincing to you. A little bit over time, this is the end of what I wanted to say, but um, that's uh, that's my claim that our galaxy once was poisoned a few million years ago, and there's the other one. <laughs> Any questions from the Peanut Gallery? Anyone? Yeah. Um, when you're going to spectroscopy, your visual light, you mentioned that you go into the infrared, can you go the other way towards x rays? Is that possible? Um, yeah, the atmosphere gets pretty opaque when you be. Uh, okay, so like a space to short. Yeah, okay. yeah. So uh, Hubble definitely did UV spectroscopy. Absolutely. So, as you were saying too, that if this, if Andromeda's quasar has been pointed at us, even at that distance at a, at a million light years plus, that could cook us, that could cook Milky Way? We can cook us. Um, there would be a tremendous amount of gamma rays. I didn't do the calculation for what the gamma rays from a blazar from Andromeda would look like. This is also a pretty weak quasar, as it is, right? Because we're only at about four million <laughs> solar masses of so small. Um, and so I think that we would probably not notice this, but it would be one of the brightest gamma resources in the sky. It might be brighter, definitely be brighter than the Milky Way. So could Sagittarius A star start feeding again and really turn itself <laughs> on and, and become a, a very bright quasar? Is that Something. There's, there is, in order for this to happen, material just has to, to get in. Right. That could happen. It's not going to happen in the time scale of our lifetimes, or you know, maybe not even time scales of millions of years. But there's plenty of material around there to come on in, and there's some evidence that that's where the nuclear star cluster is. Similar sort of event. And these things seem to happen on somewhat regular schedules. Does it so it so it stuff falls in? It, you say this happens in regular schedules, so this could happen again in hundred thousand million years or whatever. Stuff falls in, it turns on for a while, and then it shuts off. Yep, and just that's the argument. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's exactly the argument. In fact, this the same argument that was made in the nineteen eighties for why there had to be a dead quasar. And if we look out at the sky, we see all these things lit up, we see how much energy has to be out there, and you just kind of figure out how much there is and say, all right, extrapolate that back to me. How close would this thing have to be to me? And it's within, it's closer than Andromeda. Would uh, an observer on somewhere in Andromeda looking back at us, would they think we were a safer galaxy? Right, so this is what they would basically see, right? Yeah. Maybe they would argue that that was a secret galaxy, but I tend to say no, because I think if we saw this, we would say that's pretty bizarre. Here's this galaxy out there that's pretty big, and it's got an extremely bright core. And it, because it's so close, we probably would have this whole other 
idea about how to describe these things. It would be the prototype of all these other things. And so, I don't know, I mean, this is very counterfactual, right? But sure, Seifert galaxy, quasar, whatever you'd like to call it, that's, that's what they would identify as. Got a couple of questions online. Uh, one of our members, Kesa, one is, uh, how large is the black hole in Sagittarius A star? It's about four million solar masses. There. Okay. And they also asked, how far is the galaxy in the center of Einstein's cross? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, something you could look up pretty quickly, I'd say, but I don't know. That's yeah. just one quasar in Einstein's cross that just because of um, because of gravitational lensing, it's pulled it apart into four different. Great. There's a quasar. There's a galaxy in front, and then yeah. there's a quasar in the back. That's right. so you need to know both distances. Um, gravitational lensing allows you to get both of them pretty accurately, actually. Okay. Um, oh. uh, yeah, I just had a quick question: Is the uh, axis of rotation of the black hole more or less coincident with the axis of the galaxy? Excellent question. I oh, the galaxy. Not an excellent question. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I, 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 so I, there is even controversy over whether the, get, the axis of rotation of the black hole is necessarily coincident with the accretion rates. Uh, whether it's coincident with the galaxy or not, um, I don't know. I, I, I tend to think that there is no uh, correlation, but this is not this is well outside my field of studies. I actually don't know. I have to look that up. But um, good thing I, it might settle that way from momentum. It, Maybe over time. Center of the galaxy is pretty sort of spherically symmetric. Now there is some rotation to the center. It's very center. Not a lot of rotation going on. Um, so the stuff that's coming in here is settling in perhaps random reasons. But I don't know. I'd have to actually see the data to find out. I don't know. Um, so one of the things that we talked about at dinner tonight, and since we are talking about black holes, so why not the suit de jour of black holes today? And that is that there is, seems to be um, an idea that black holes and dark energy have some, maybe some sort of um, a close kinship. Could you talk on that at all? Yeah. So. I don't know a lot about this particular idea in detail. <laughs> All I can say is from reading the papers and having a few discussions a few days ago, uh, there was a press release from um, uh, astronomers out of the University of Cambridge um, who were arguing that black holes and dark energy might be connected because black holes could be, for example, the source of dark energy or the reason that black holes are growing is because of some sort of connection to dark energy. And the argument there seems to be that black holes um, are always growing, which we know is the case. Uh, and supermassive black holes, like every other black hole, are growing over the course of the uh, age of the universe. And you can actually calculate what that growth looks like. And it, has the same characteristic as the actual sort of growth of the volume of the universe. And the thing that is dominating in the universe's volume right now is dark energy. So there's this, this coincidence is the main argument for why those things are connected. In a theoretical sense, I don't think there is much more to it than that. There might be models that people can come up with to connect black holes and dark energy now. But um, but all of them are pretty exotic. They're not standard models by any means. That doesn't mean they're wrong. It's just not something that people have pursued. And there isn't any other evidence except for what I just said, as far as I know, that this is the case. Um, so I don't know. I talked to one scientist that said they gave it a 99% chance that this is never going to be heard about again. <laughs> <laughs> So you'll see, I mean, these sorts of ideas come out from time to time, and most of them turn out to not be right. Sometimes they turn out to be right. So it'd be good to keep an open mind. Should we wrap it up? 
a clarification from case of uh, about uh, Sagittarius A. He was asking about the radius of Sagittarius A. Ah, the radius. Well, fortunately, the mass and radius closely linked. Um, and so you can do this by saying that the sun's radius, if you pick the sun and made it into a black hole, it's about three kilometers or so. Mm -hmm. And so then you can scale that up basically the same way. Um, so if it's three kilometers for the sun and it's four million suns, then it would be three times four, about 12 million kilometers, right here about, I think about the size of the event horizon. That's just calculating um, in public, which is often embarrassingly wrong. So if I get that wrong, <laughs> um, so that's about the size of what did you say? Uh, about 12 million kilometers. You said it was the size of something in the photo, or did you say that? Um, so the, a black hole, uh, a, a, a convenient scaling relation to remember is that a black hole about the size of the sun has a radius of about three kilometers. Yeah. And that's a one to one. That, so the bigger the black hole, the bigger the radius, the one to one. So I should be able to just multiply. I think that'll work. All right. All right. No, no questions online. Thank you, Dr.